welcome to the Become a Guitarist Today podcast with myself, Adam Roach. Now don't forget, if you do like this podcast, hit the like button, subscribe, and the little bell so you don't miss out in any episodes. So in today's episode, I talk to Dana Strum from the band Slaughter. And we talk all about the festival coming up next week, which is the Glam Festival. It will be uh, all around Australia. So I hope you enjoy the podcast, and I'll see you on the next one. Good morning. Dang. How are you? Good. How are you, mate? I'm doing very good. How about yourself? I see guitars on the wall. That's cool. Yeah, just a few. Yes, and I see some electronic drums. There we go. You're a music guy. I love it. That's it. That, that's why yeah. I'm involved. Kicking ass. Yeah, music takes Yeah, time. kicking ass. Kicking <laughs> ass. That's it. Yeah, no, I just, just woke up, so forgive my voice. <laughs> uh, no, no problem whatsoever. We're all scrambling because... We play a show in Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's a sellout at a casino. Mm. Uh, we leave tomorrow, oh, wow. and we then play the show Saturday. We travel to L.A. on Super Bowl Sunday because mm. I couldn't even get home to Las Vegas because of the Super Bowl. It's being held in Las Vegas. Oh wow! <laughs> so uh, we had to divert, go to L.A., and then we take the plane over from Los Angeles to uh, Sydney, then to Melbourne, and. Uh, so it's a it's a little bit of doing, you know. And then we come when we come back from those dates, we play a day and a half later in Tunica, Mississippi. So it's a uh, yeah, it, it's planes, trains, automobiles for sure. And I do a great deal of that myself. So uh, it, it's wearing a number of hats for sure. I always have. Yeah, so you you need a holiday after this one. Um. Well, no, I mean, we we go on the Monsters of Rock cruise shortly after that, oh, four yeah. days after that, yeah. um, and that's always good fun. Uh, but it's uh, it's it's not a holiday. I proudly <laughs> call the boat uh, for everybody there. We all get to be a the SS derelict. We all get you know, get to be shipmates together. So it's yeah. good fun. <laughs> so you, you don't get seasick at all. Uh, you know, it's funny when I was a kid, I did, uh, but on those boats. You know, I mean, I've played and felt the stage, you know, moving when you're playing yeah, yeah. and you're like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, this is not part of what I signed up for. But then, you know, you take it in stride and, and make the best of it. And uh, I mean, it's a little fun in that back dressing room where there's no windows and the thing is moving <laughs> and you're like, oh, man, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, but I mean, listen, when you I've toured a, a, a lot of my life and uh you know, you've I've I've had food poisoning on tour, and you just kind of lean over in a bucket and throw up in the bucket and keep playing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I guess it separates the men from the boys a little bit, but you know that's that's such as life. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've done two cruises and been sick both times. Like, a, oh know. wow, really? Yeah, just so just play. from the, did you have a window in your cabin or anything? Yeah, well, it was actually a window in the cabin, but it was from Melbourne to Tasmania. It was like it's really rough. At Bass Strait, um, and I was actually we were playing with the band, and in, in between sets, I just had to go throw up and then come back. And <laughs> it was oh shocking. yeah, I, I you know be I had there was a meet and greet deal, and I just wasn't wasn't really feeling well, and um, it was you know holding to people, hey, thank you so much for liking the music, and I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I'll be right back, yeah. and I just I went to like one of the service doors. I just shoved the door open and just like projectile vomit. Like, <laughs> oh, and uh, you know, I'm like, oh, this is humiliating, you know, but it's it's life. And they're like, Are you all right? I'm like, I don't think so, no. <laughs> and they're like, Okay, could we redo the picture? And I'm like, Yeah, sure. And you're like, I mean, you know, anything will happen. Yeah, I did. I wipe wipe my face off and try to chew some gum and I'm like, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know? And, uh, yeah, so no, it's, it's, it's happened. Uh, but I, I went on kind of not feeling well, you know, yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's life of touring. There's nothing worse than playing sick or traveling sick because you know, you're going to play. And then the paranoia of, all right, nine o'clock show time. Oh fuck. Here's the opening act. Oh fuck! Here's the next act. Like, gotta gotta get it together. Gotta get it together. Yeah. And um, there's there's or flying sick because you're like looking around like, all right, if I have to beeline for the fucking head, you know, I gotta go. Yeah. And uh, it, I mean, it 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 sucks. Now on the flight from Los Angeles um, to Sydney, that's a, a 
15, 16 hours worth of looking around. Yeah. It's a it's a good haul. Yeah, that's right. But do you find like once you're on stage, it like that just magically disappears? Like the sickness? It, it, a lot of it does. I mean, I've I've always wanted to play since I was a younger kid. Hmm. I kind of knew when I was 11, 12 years old that I hoped this was what I was going to do. And uh, I didn't go to uh, junior high or, or high school like dances and sports things. All I did was play. Yeah. And uh, I just played in my room. And uh, I just hoped and hoped. And then, what do you want to do for your birthday? One day, I hope I'm on stage for my birthday. That's mm -hmm. what I hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess my story is a little bit of be careful of what you wish for. Because... Uh, here I am at my age, still doing it and still loving it when the lights go down. Yeah, that's good. That's excellent. Yeah, you know, I feel I feel the same way. So, well, I mean, I just teach and do the occasional gigs, not like you guys, but yeah, I really appreciate what you you do. So it's good. <laughs> uh, I mean, listen, it, you give people a good time and an escape and a release. Mm. Hopefully, you inspire some people that maybe want to play. Um, we all of us played because you saw someone or something that moved you or inspired you. Yeah. And some of us, it could be you included, said, you know, man, I want to do that. Mm. And look at that, that guy. And look how he's playing the drums. And, you know, look at this guy. And, um, you know, if, if we do that to others, it's a great thing. And uh, most important is I always tell the band guys, look, we're a bunch of, just a bunch of stupid fucking entertainers. Our job is to make people feel good. Yeah. I mean, what a great job. Just make people feel good with music that they like. Yeah. And uh, what a gift that is to be able to do that. So oh, sure. uh, I've, as you go on in the years, I appreciated it more and more and more. In the earlier years, I was like, this is what I wanted. And then of course, tragedies can happen the original guitar player of slaughter died in a horrific car truck crash not that far from las vegas a couple hundred miles and uh myself and the drummer were supposed to be in the vehicle with him and we said look we're gonna stay and work and you know he's like come on you pussies you know and really you know peer pressure to get us to go and then of course when it happened we're both like wow 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 um uh, mm -hmm. you don't count on things like that um, I didn't count on recommending that Randy Rhodes uh, join Ozzy and then he dies in a plane crash mm -hmm. when, in fact, prior to flying to England, he had never flown before. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, I said, we well, on vacation with your family or something. You probably did. Uh, and he's no. And then his mother, Dolores Rhodes, uh, when she went to see him, she had also never flown before. Mm -hmm. How does he die? in a plane crash mm -hmm. i mean you're like and you know you 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 think a little bit maybe i never should have done this you know this guy would yeah. be alive um and you know everything from that time even uh you know i said look this is we're gonna go go meet him and you're gonna play and all i want you to do is play the stuff that you play at the starwood yeah. and um you know he he kind of says to me i don't really like black sabbath <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, let's not tell him that. You know, <laughs> let's let's yeah, let's let's let him, you know, enjoy what you do. And uh, I think I'm right. I think if he sees you do what I see you do at the Starwood, there's nobody in their right mind that wouldn't get it. Yeah. But uh, the truth was he wasn't really in his right mind when he saw him. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, that could work good or that could work bad. Yeah. Uh, I think it probably worked both, you know, good and bad. I don't know if he com if Ozzy really completely knew, but I think he thought what whatever that was, if that was all real and what I was hearing was real, holy crap. Yeah. And uh, there were a few more choice words than that. I guess I'm dumbing it down. But, um, you know, when, when he died, um, I had a crazy feeling of guilt. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I, I, I never should have done this. The guy's dead now. And I mean, it was just, you know, a, a lot. I learned driving down the road, <clears throat> pulling over, hearing it on the radio. And then everything went back through my head. Like, I know, oh my God, what did I do? Hmm. And I always thought that I had kind of pressured or coerced him 
into trying and and bring your talents to this guy and great things can happen and he's like you don't know that i'm like i do know that that's what i'm trying to tell you i do know that no one is recognizing you here in la and and this is it this could be he needs you as bad as you need a him and uh you know that their whole band quiet riot all the early guys they did not like sabbath so i said uh how can you play like that and say you don't like Sabbath, that style? And he had this incredible answer that really for my whole life changed me uh, because I didn't see his influence off the bat. Mm. And uh, he says, well, I brought you something. And I said, uh, oh, we get no need to do that. And he said, uh, it, well, it's a cassette. And at the time you might remember there were album bootlegs yeah, yeah. and cassette bootlegs. Yeah. He brings me a cassette and he says, you know, all the stuff that you like that I do, it's on this cassette. I said, oh, is it you, you know, you playing live at the Starwood or the Whiskey? Oh, no, it's who I took it from. So as I'm looking at him with the frosted hair, he had a polka dot vest, big hoop earrings. <laughs> and I'm looking at him, he goes, well, you ever heard of David Bowie? Oh, really? like, of course I've heard of David Bowie. He goes, well, you know that guitar player guy, Mick Ronson? And now I'm looking at him. I'm like, Jesus Christ, you look just like Mick Ronson. Uh, I never even thought about it. Yeah. And uh, I, I never thought with the polka dots. I mean, he was dressing like him. Yeah. His guitar was the same cream color Les Paul that Mick Ronson. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, wow. He is emulating Mick Ronson. Yeah. And he goes, he was so good and he was great. And no one got him. I said, well, here's the thing, buddy. You're so good and you're great. And right now, not many people are getting you. Keep in mind, every A&R executive, every musician, everybody in Los Angeles during that movement mm. came in and out of the Starwood. Yeah. And no one made him a proposal to do anything. Mm. And I'm like, I got to knock on the dressing room door and just say, I don't, I'm not in any way insulting your band or anything like that. You're just too good to be doing what we're all doing here at the Starwood. Yeah. Now, I'm going to do something about it. He's like, how? I said, I don't know yet, but there's going to be a thing. Within weeks, Ozzy comes up into my dressing room, and I said, I know the guy. I know the guy. Be just only doing the right thing. There was no business deal to anything. It yeah. was just I believed in the talent I saw, and I was on a fucking mission. And um, – you know, that mission changed music history. Oh, yeah. I mean, thank God you did. I mean, look, yeah, that's some of those songs from that, that album with Ozzy, just incredible. Yeah, that, I mean, the, syner I the synergy that happened, uh, there, was, there were a few rehearsals with Frankie Benelli, myself, and Randy. And I remember I looked over and Ozzy was sitting on this couch and I'm like, he's actually better today than I've seen him at the start. I mean, he just came into himself. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some people had said, well, maybe it's because he was free of the same thing. Um, and I, whatever it was, uh, you know, it was, it, there was magic. And and the synergy that happened between them and then being put away there at Ridge Farm. You know, he asked me a number of times, um, well, what's he going to do? I said, here's the thing. I don't think he knows what he's going to do. He relies on riffs and parts and kind of sings over them. And, um, you know, it was really interesting. Uh, I didn't know Ozzy at all. He came and saw my band and it was very Sabbath derivative. And uh, at one point, he literally sounds like Black Sabbath. I said, I love Black Sabbath. So, yeah, I, I stole everything I could. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so go figure this guy come in, you know, in his condition and hearing like, wow, I could just sing anything I want over that. but. I, I had asked him because I didn't know, and it was very innocent. Uh, so, hey, what do you play? And he looks at me, what do you mean? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I mean, what do you play the bass? Do you play any guitar? Do you play a uh, keyboard or, you know? And he's like, no. I'm like, no to the keyboard? Or he's like, I don't play anything. <laughs> and I'm like, well, how, how do you make that stuff up? And he says, uh, Oh, it, it, it's in it's in my head. And I said, uh, now, keep in mind, I'm young, naive. And I'm like, 
do it. Go ahead, just do it. And he's like, I'm not auditioning for you, Dana. Right? <laughs> I said, I didn't, I didn't say that. I just said, if it's in your head, do it. Mm -hmm. And he's like, ah. I said, uh, I said, just do it. <laughs> and and uh, so he did. He puts his finger in his ear. He's like, I wanna. I said, you can stop right now. <laughs> you can stop right now. I know music well. It's been my whole life. And you are the guy that made those parts up. Because yeah. they are so unique and different that, yeah, you're that guy. And he's like, I did. And you could see the deflation. Hmm. And he really did not know if anything was going to go at all. Because don't forget, Black Sabbath had Ronnie Dio and a hit record with Heaven and Hell. Yeah. And he knew that. And Heaven and Hell was really a, a damn good record. Uh, some you know legendary parts and songs on that. And uh, he had a whole lot of doubt. And I said, dude, people love you. You're, you're Ozzy, you're the voice of Black Sabbath. It doesn't matter. You know, and Ronnie Dio is great. But you're that guy. And uh, I said, if people are like me and they like that early stuff, who could really sing that early stuff? I mean, it. Yeah. And he would tell. He, he later I learned they would just sit around. Tony would come in with parts. Geezer would play another part. The drummer would play, and then he would just start singing anything he could over it. Mm. And I'm like, but that's why it sounds that way. It's so real. It it because it is real. Right. It wasn't a click track in a studio and Pro Tools. Mm. If you time corrected all that stuff <laughs> and cleaned it up. It probably ruined everything. That's right. It's That's right. it's four blokes in a room that only knew what they knew, mm -hmm. and that was the beauty of it all. Yeah, that's amazing. And I must say, you do the best Aussie impersonation as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those early they, they, those early times when I was around him, I was a big fan. Yeah. And um, straight up, straight up. I mean, my my group sounded a lot like Sabbath. And uh, and I loved it. And so when I was around him, he that's, that's that guy from Black Sabbath, you know, Iron Man and Children of the Grave, and all this shit. Hmm. And uh, so, of course, I saw him in questionable condition. And I'm like, my hero is shit face drunk. You know? <laughs> and uh, and uh, so it 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 was a little bit of getting used to and a little bit of but this was what he was in that condition, upset, depressed at what had happened. And I continuously said, like, you don't understand. I have the guy and this is all going to happen. Mm. And he's like, I fucking hope you're right, kid. Mm. And I said, oh, no, I am right. He's yeah. like, well, you don't know that. I said, well, believe it or not, I think I do. And uh, that night, you know, within 35, 40 seconds of hearing Randy play, uh, he's like, tell the, tell the kid he's got a job please. And I'm like, I knew it. Yeah. And uh, then he says, now take me home. <laughs> I'm like, but the truth is they never met that night. Mm -hmm. Randy was uh, much more straight laced, really didn't drink. Ozzy was absolutely annihilated. And I, in my mind, I think the worst thing I could do is poison the mix with the truth. I just need to let a sleeping dog lie. And it happened later, but they never did meet that night ever. Actually, he never saw him. Wow. <laughs> I dimmed the lights down in the large uh, instrument room. You put drums and, and, and ISO booths in there and in, out in the studio area. We were in the control room and between the two panes of glass being a little tinted and the lights down, they actually never saw each other. Wow. And it was good both ways, really. You know, <laughs> Ozzy was a wreck and and Randy was different looking, say, than Tony or those guys were, you know, tough guys. <laughs> and um, Randy was polka dots and a little more frail. <laughs> and um, I I just thought, fuck it. He didn't ask. So I'm not going to say anything. You know? <laughs> and uh, look, it's a it even putting Jake in the band after that. Mm. Um, it was just one of those things where like. No, I think that's the guy. And uh, there was a little back and forth with George Lynch about that. And, uh, and uh, but they, I mean, Jake had the vibe and the pizzazz. And in the end, uh, you know, he had the stage presence and, and the thing, I think, again, entertaining. I yeah. think people wanted to be like him. 
Mm. Uh, yeah. And I think plenty of guitar players wanted to be like Randy. But funny enough, in the day in Hollywood, really not true. Mm. And that goes to show you somebody can have incredible talent and skill, but people may not get it unless there's some funny conduit that brings it together. And, you know, I've been fortunate to be that conduit in a number of circumstances. And, and I, I take it as I was fortunate, I was lucky, and I'm also grateful I had the chance to do that. Um, in the end, if Randy didn't do that, who knows what would or wouldn't have happened. He was going to go on and teach classical guitar. Mm -hmm. And so, his his game plan, I'm sure you've read that, yeah, he was yeah. going to go on and he, he really loved playing the legitimate classical guitar. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the stuff he would do would be kind of classical movements, Mick Ronson style. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. I'm like, Mick, Ro Mick Ronson, like, how did I never get that? But I didn't think it, you know, it's sometimes I, I thought he played a little more like early Brian May. I mean, there were in his solo that he did. I loved early Queen. And again, in the U.S., early Queen, you either really got them mm. or people like, it's all bullshit. I, I don't get it. <laughs> and uh, I loved early Queen. I loved Ogre Battle, Stone Cold Crazy, uh, Keep Yourself Alive, all that stuff. And I always thought Brian May had this just incredible thing. He was like, that's another dimension, what this guy does. And uh, Randy had in his acapella solo kind of, and I'm like, it's Brian May. <laughs> and uh, never saw Mick Ronson out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. If you look at a picture of Randy and Mick Ronson, it's shocking. Yeah. You put them put them side by side and you're like, holy crap. And, and the, the polka dots, the vest, the guitar, like the hair frost, the same color of the hair. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, he loved Mick Ronson and wanted to emulate that. But truth, even though I loved his playing, I never really got the dead on influence. Mm. Never thought about it. Yeah, no, you wouldn't. I mean, Hearing what the coming out of wasn't quite right at the time. You didn't really hear that <laughs> in there. You connect the dots, no. Yeah, yeah. No. Right. I must say he did influence me to start the classical guitar back in the day. So <laughs> that was really there good. There you go. Yeah. 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 He, he look, he taught lessons at his mom's school. And many of the times when I would call to uh hey, I, I need to talk to Randy, I need to figure out he's teaching lessons right now and you're stop calling here. <laughs> like no one will ever believe this really. <laughs> you know? And I mean, Dolores Rhodes yelled at me repeatedly, you know, <laughs> stop calling. And I'm like, I'm going to change this guy's life. You know? <laughs> but that was me thinking that not knowing that. And it was her like, you know, <laughs> I've got a business to run. And I'm yeah. like, well, he's going to you know, be in a big business, <laughs> but uh, you know, Hey, you, you never know till you know, but yeah. I did have that gut instinct and never, never didn't really. Yeah. Even at first, you know, the record at first, when it came out, people are, it's interesting. And the guitar guy sounds good, but it didn't light the entire world on fire. It took a little while. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 no. People are going to flip when they really dig into this. <laughs> you know, this guy is so unique. Um, he's just, he just plays like him. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So with Ozzy, I mean, you don't have to answer this, but um, I read a thing saying that you actually played bass on, I don't know, Suicide Solution and Crazy Train. Now, can you say that's true or not? Or is that no go? <laughs> um, what, what I'm going to tell you is it's not true on the recorded versions that came out. Some of the parts were played with in the early rehearsal because Randy would play certain parts and we were all there. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I thought, well, it's funny, it sounds like me. And and um, I'm like, because chances are tape was running and any ideas that were happening at the time could or could not have been lifted. I long ago didn't think of that, but those rehearsals with uh, with Frankie and, and Randy and myself and Ozzy just trying to sing along, um, it was essentially what he told me that he had to do to get in the groove and write. And hey, if I feel it, just keep, keep playing the same thing. And um, I found that I do it when I write and when Mark Slaughter and I wrote even the Slaughter stuff, like, no, 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 keep, keep going, keep going. You know, it's like that boyish thing in you. Mm. Okay. That's fair enough. That's good. 
Yeah, because I think it was an interview with uh, Bobby Rock. He was talking, he was actually praising you a lot about your, you know, time back recording with Vinnie Vincent and producing and everything. He said, you, you know, you were just amazing. So, yeah. I've, I lived on the floor of a recording studio. I uh, used to wrap the cables and clean the toilets. And I quickly uh, became a second engineer guy. And because I lived on the floor and I didn't have any money, all I could do is put up mixes of stuff and try to get better and better and better. So by the time I was working with others, I had a little more skill set up my sleeve than the average bear because I lived. And at the time, people didn't have computer recording in their bedroom. Yeah. You had either a big console and tape machines and big speakers and small speakers, and you had to know how to use it or you had nothing. And it was cost prohibitive for most people. It was expensive. And if somebody bought all that stuff, the user had to pay a lot for it. So I was lucky because uh, somebody, how do, you, how do you say you're lucky if you lived on the floor? But because I was there, when everybody would go, I take out two inch tapes and start fucking with them. Mm. And uh, I would the next day, hey, what do you think of this? Like, you did that last night? Like, yeah, what do you think? Like, pretty fucking you know it's pretty good <laughs> and uh so i learned more and more and more and by the time i was doing that stuff i knew what the machines would do and what they wouldn't do and i had a pretty good grasp on it so by the time i was doing Vinny vincent uh with bobby um i had there was no fear you know yeah. if, if if bobby looked at me like hey man let's i'm like i already heard it let's go mm. you know he's like you sure i heard it let's go yeah. and uh he's like dude you're just gonna I heard it. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I had fun with him. Uh, he's a, he's a great guy. He's a great musician. I love him. We still talk to this day. That's good. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, he was saying like you were the like the king of you know punching in and out, <laughs> which was hard to do back then. Yeah. Yes. It, it. It. I knew it. Like I said, I knew what the machines would do, and I knew where you could go in and out. And if and if I thought I I would usually solo the track. Mm -hmm. Nope. 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 I got to do it again. You'll hear that. Yeah. yeah. And. Uh, you know, that and needless to say to, uh, you know, everybody that I worked with, that was a huge benefit. Mm. That's for sure. Especially yeah. then, because now you'd edit, but that was your form of manually editing on the fly then and there. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's really good. A little easier to cut the waveform now. <laughs> but uh, I still like to go in, you know. I mean, I still like, I'd rather have a guy play and just don't dive in. And well, what did you do? You know, don't worry about it. Just keep playing. And then, okay, now listen back and see if you think you could ever play this. He's like, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really good. That's because we put together the best of what you can do. And I always tell people, what is a recording artist? Like, I love the Beatles. Mm. I think they were so unique with their songwriting and stuff, but they were recording artists. They could use the devices and really maximize the ideas. And so they made their paintings with the equipment and their mind and their hands and their abilities. You didn't have to be a virtuoso. If you knew what these things would do and you knew how to work with them, you were an artist using all of the tools that were available to you. So, I mean, many people I'm like, do you know what a recording artist is? You're not like a live virtuoso. A recording artist like, but they need someone to help string it back out of them so that what you're hearing back could potentially be better than what you maybe ever could do in a bass. Mm -hmm. And if you've done that, you've probably, as a producer or writer, done a really good job of helping that person to bring their ideas into real life. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, yeah, so just, just quickly going over to your tour coming down here. So, yeah, like I said, Melbourne, tell me what, next week or so, 16th of February. Then you got yes. Brisbane on the 17th and uh, Sydney on the 18th. Um, now, so I was lucky to see you back in 1990. I was over in uh, Michigan with my band called Eclipse back then. And we got to see you guys with Kiss and Faster Pussycat at the Toledo Sports Arena. So that, that was the yes. last time I saw you. Now, no, so you've never been to Australia, have you? No, well. no. I was in New Zealand uh, with Vince Neal, um, and but neither one of us played there. We were only using it as a stopover to go to oh. Singapore. Oh, really? And uh, and I said, you know, man, there's Australia right there. Yeah, and and uh, so no, I'm I'm excited about going, and I'm excited about letting people hear and feel what we do. Yeah. 
No, I can't wait. Like I said, back, even back then, you know, it was amazing and inspired all us. Uh, you know, we're pretty much the same type of music, you know, the hard rock. Actually, I'll just quickly show you. This is the old band. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> that was back in 1990, that was. That's, that's great. Same, same year we saw you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that, that KISS tour for us was because with uh, Vinnie Vincent, we had toured with Iron Maiden. We had uh, done a number of tours. Um, and now when we went out, I'm like, no, this is exactly what we're going to do from the minute the lights go down to the minute we're off. And mm -hmm. if we can't win people in that 35 minutes, we lose. Mm -hmm. About that simple. Yep. So, I mean, we gave it we gave it a pretty good go every night and we garnered really wonderful popularity. We were really lucky uh, on that tour that that people gave us that chance. And then um, we earned our place the best we could. Yeah. So who's playing drums for you now? Jordan Canada. He's amazing. He was in a group called Adrenaline Mob. He's he's incredible. He, he is. I was watching it last night when the stuff he does, he's, you know, he's a real showman. He's amazing. <laughs> he he is just one motherfucker player. And he was Berkeley educated. So the thing is, he can write out every note he's playing. Wow. So he's, he's uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and I've seen him actually chart it out. Yeah. So uh, he came in and we had canceled flights the first time we were going to use Jordan. And I'm like, oh, fuck, man. I'm like, yeah. we need that sound check. And the day before to rehearse, we can't just put this kid up and play, you know, 80 minutes set. And the guy's never played a note with us. And I'm like, look, man, I'm really sorry about this. He goes, look, I'm ready. Mm. I said, well, how? He's like, I, it's all charted. You'll never know it, but I've got it all charted. And he played the set like he wrote it. And I'm like, holy fuck, man. I don't know where the hell you came from, but holy fuck. And he's great. And his attitude is great. And he loves entertaining. And it's always really cool to see that. You yeah, know. exactly. We're still tight with Bloss. Bloss plays with Trans Siberian Orchestra. He plays with Blue Men. He plays in the Rock Vault, okay. and uh, we love him. You know, but we've—it's like ships in the night. You know, everybody has a thing they do. And and uh, funny, I was in a car with Bloss. We were signing box sets in Nashville, and um, he's like Jordan Canada. I follow him on Instagram. <laughs> I'm like, there you go. Yeah, you know? yeah he's incredible. Man. I'm not really one to get right into you know, drum solos. That's usually my toilet break. But um, his solo was just incredible. The stuff he does. He and and you know if you let him keep going, which we we can't, we don't have enough time. But it goes just all kinds of wild places. Yeah. And um, yeah, he's a gifted, gifted, wonderful person. Yeah, yeah that's going to be awesome. I can't wait to see it. So yeah, I'll hopefully see you guys next week on the sixteenth. Yeah. Yes, you will. And. Uh, thank you for the support and thank you for the good vibe. And uh, we look forward for sure to play for you. Come, yeah. Are you able to come back and say hello? I hope so. I'll talk to John from us and hopefully we can arrange please, it. Please, please do, will you? You know, just yeah. tell him I, 